We now have the pleasure of hearing our first moderator and our first keynote speaker. I would like to invite Dr. Mary Beth Aldrich, the Strategy and Policy Department Chair at the Naval War College. Could you please help me welcome Dr. Ulrich to the stage? Valerie Hudson is a university distinguished professor and George H.W. Bush Chair at the Bush School of Government and Public Service at Texas A&M University, where she directs the Bush School's program on women, peace, and security. Her scholarship has focused on foreign policy analysis, security studies, gender, and international relations. She's widely published including in such renowned journals as International Security, the American Political Science Review, the Journal of Peace Research, and Foreign Policy Analysis. She and her research team have done the most to harness data to illuminate the systemic insecurity of women worldwide and to explain that women's insecurity contributes to national and regional insecurity. Her book, Sex and World Politics provides an impressive amount of social demographic data to back up this claim. I have used both editions of her book in a WPS course that I've taught in recent years and can attest to its rigorous use of empirical data. Perhaps D Dr. Hudson's greatest ongoing contribution is her leadership of the Women's Stats Database, which she founded as a co-principal investigator. Women's Stats is the largest compilation of data on the status of women in the world today. Its tagline is, the fate of nations is tied to the status of women. The Women's Stats website goes on to say, Women's Stats makes this linkage visible and demonstrable. Women's Stats collects data from 175 countries and codes 350 variables related to topics ranging from domestic violence to female land ownership to political participation and relates this data to the likelihood of conflict. The US Congress, various UN agencies, and many other entities have used data from women's stats to inform their policy decisions. You will learn much more about this empirical juggernaut in Dr. Hudson's presentation. This research has also been cited in the New York Times, The Economist, and even on 60 Minutes. Dr. Hudson has earned too many accolades to detail here, but I would like to mention <clears throat> her award-winning book, um, 2009, Fair Branches, Security Implications of Asia's Surplus Male Population, which won multiple national book awards. And also her major grants from the National Science Foundation and the Department of Defense's Minerva Research Program. I would also like to congratulate Dr. Hudson on the publication of her new book, The First Political Order, How Sex Shapes Governance and National Security Worldwide. I understand that you are about to receive an excellent overview of Dr. Hudson's latest findings from this book in her presentation today. So for the next 50, 50 minutes or so, I invite you to listen attentively and to pose challenging questions. I guarantee that once you hear Dr. Hudson's empirically supported arguments, you will never again frame national security in the conventional ways that you have to date. So please join me in giving Dr. Valerie Hudson, a pioneering scholar in the fields of foreign policy analysis, and women, peace, and security, and as I just recently learned, a former, uh, a proud and former Army reservist, and we both have in common, we are graduates of the Army Airborne School. And let's give her a warm Naval War College welcome. <laughs> I'm so delighted to be here. I'm from Texas A&M. Some of you in the audience may be from, and you know what I'm going to say, right? First of all, I'm going to say howdy, and you're going to say howdy back, right? Howdy. howdy. Right. Texas A&M grads, whoop. Woo. Yeah. 
Okay, <laughs> all right, wonderful. Thank you, Admiral Garvin, Dr. Yamin, uh, Dr. Ulrich, and all of the Naval War College for inviting me here. I am excited to talk to you about this research. Uh, and what my aim is today is to try, in essence, to change your vision uh, about what national security is and, and how we get it. Uh, and so I'm going to talk to you about my research findings, and then after those research findings, we're going to talk a little bit about policy implications, right? Because at the Bush School of Government and Public Service, we always tie what we learn academically to what it is that we think, uh, you know, policy uh, should be aiming for. So let's take a look at what we can do here. First of all, I do want to boast that we have one of the best women peace and security programs, not just in the nation, but in the world at Texas A&M University. So if you ever have the chance, we've welcomed uh, a number of folks from uh, US Air Force Academy and other places, uh, US Army Fellows Program. If you ever have any chance uh, to study WPS somewhere, we hope you'll choose Texas A&M. And as Dr. Ulrich pointed out, um, I'm gonna be overviewing this particular book uh, the First Political Order, uh, How Sex Shapes Governance and National Security Worldwide. So if you want to delve into all of the reasoning, the case studies, the historical lessons, et cetera, et cetera, uh, I urge you to, um, to go ahead and get that book. Put it by your nightstand. It's like 600 pages long, so you can fall asleep to it over the course of like a year. And, <laughs> but I guarantee you, there's so much more to be said than I can say in just the few minutes that we have together, so. All right, now, the claim um, that starts out our book is a claim that uh, I, I don't think is, is very controversial, but maybe you haven't thought about it before, which is that the very first political order in any society is the sexual political order that is established between roughly the two halves of the population, male and female. And we argue that the character of that first political order is gonna mold the society, its governance and even its behavior. Uh, what we have, and, and sometimes I, I tell my students, let's pretend we're in a video game design class and um, I want you to design a game. And the only parameters are there's roughly two equal sized groups and if they don't find a way to cooperate, the game ends. So build me a game. And inevitably, my students will come back to me and they'll say, well, that's not enough information. You gotta tell me more stuff. And I say, well, what uh, exactly do you wanna know? And that's when we begin to reveal the politics of the matter. They'll say, so these two groups, do they stand before each other as equals or as one inferior and one superior? So when decisions are made by the group, is it made by one you know, of the groups for both or is, is it made jointly? Uh, if there's conflicts between the interests of the two groups, how are those conflicts resolved? Are they resolved by uh, a violence and dominance, or are they resolved by uh, compromise? And then, of course, the queen of all political questions, how are valuable resources distributed among these two groups? No matter what those resources are, could be a land or cattle or gold or whatever, how are they distributed among the two groups? And I say, bingo, bingo. What you've put your finger on is that these are all political questions and how you answer those questions with regard to men and women in society can't help but set the groundwork for how you're gonna answer these questions at a societal level and then an inter-societal level uh, and so forth. Um, so um, for uh, most of my career, I've been looking at women's situation in their societies. And I have used over and over again the indicators that I thought were the most important. Female literacy, female labor force participation, female representative, uh, representation in parliament or the legislature. Uh, and uh, used those for many years until I had, uh, about 20 years ago, uh, a little less than 20 years ago, I had a, a stunning conversation which changed my mind about these things. 
Uh, and it was a conversation I had. My university at the time had invited out some of the women who had been elected in Afghanistan. Remember, the United States imposed a quota of 25% on the Afghan legislature, 25% had to be women, which was ironic because in the US Congress at the time, we didn't even have 25% women. <laughs> so it's really rather ironic. Anyway, so, um, you know, being sort of the nerdy intellectual type, you know, um, uh, uh, I was assigned to be the hostess for one particular member of parliament at lunch. and. And of course, uh, some of you nerdy types, you know how difficult that is. You have to make chit chat with someone you don't know. So your heart's pounding. You're like, what do I say? What do I say? So I was like, isn't it wonderful? You're, you're a trained pediatrician. You've been to university. And now you're a member of parliament. Gosh, Afghan women are really advancing, aren't they? You know, and I look back and I say, oh, that was the dorkiest thing to say. But she was very kind and she said, um, I don't think you understand, Valerie. And uh, she said, um, if I went home today and my husband wanted to divorce me, he could say I'd divorce you three times and I would be divorced. And if he divorced me, I would no longer have custody of my children because in Afghanistan, the children always go with the father. If he divorced me, I would have no place to live because my father's family would not take me back for the shame of it. And you cannot live as a single woman in Afghanistan. There would be no place for me at all. And she said, even if I remain married, I may have little say in who my children marry or at what age they marry. So how empowered am I really, Valerie? And I thought, oh my gosh. I've been looking in the wrong place. You know, we're uh, a country that has one of the highest female literacy rates in the world, Saudi Arabia, right? One of the countries that has highest female labor force participation is, is Thailand. One of the countries that has, in fact, the, the country that has the highest female representation in parliament is Rwanda, okay? And I can tell you that there are serious challenges for women in all of those countries. So the indicators that I was looking at as to where to find that original political order between men and women, I was looking in the wrong places, right? I was looking in the wrong places. I need to look elsewhere. Because what I was interested in, it's a long-term research goal, was kind of assessing the first political order in the societies of the world. Was it more towards one end of the spectrum where the groups are equal and clashes of interest are resolved by compromise and resources are allocated more equitably, so more towards the other side of the scale, where the opposite is occurring. I'd like to place countries along that kind of spectrum. And so uh, after that critical conversation and then in consultation with lots and lots of experts, we decided that what we really needed to look at was not things like female literacy, right? Those would be spin-offs of something much deeper. And that would be, what is the situation of women in their households, right? In their households. So, how much say does a woman have about getting married? And how old is she when she's married? How much of a say does a woman have when she is married? What types of property and inheritance rights uh, do women have? Are there inequities in family law, such as in divorce and child custody that the Afghan MP was talking to me about? Is marriage patrilocal, where the bride moves, right, to where the groom and his family live? Um, how about bride price and dowry? Are those paid? Um, how about polygyny or cousin marriage? Right? What we're looking at here is systematic forms by which women get a lesser say and are more vulnerable. Does the society view domestic violence and femicide as normal, even expected, even obligatory in certain cases? And how is rape treated? Is it treated as a crime against the woman or as a property crime 
against her husband or her father, right? What we're looking at here is, is the ways in which women become subordinated as human beings within their own families and their own households. That's where you're gonna find the characteristics of the sexual political order. All right, so my colleagues and I developed a theory, right? We said, here are right, the various forms of, of the subjugation of women that will clue you in that you have got a very unequal and inequitable sexual political order. And these things are like magnetic beads, so we call them a syndrome, right? Because once you get a few of them, it's hard not to have the whole group of them. So what we were looking at is, is how many of these mechanisms of subordinating women are present within a society and that will indicate to us what the character of that first political order is. So up at the top, all right, um, what is the degree of willingness to use violence and force against women within the society? And we know even the United States is very poorly on that one. And then coming across the top there, how about control of valuable resources? All right? What types of property and inheritance rights uh, do women have? We then assess the degree to which the society is uh, patrilineal, right? That is, is the family considered the male line? Do women marry out, right, in patrilocal marriage? And then uh, the real kin in the family are the men, not the women. There may be a cousin marriage variant of that. Um, and then if the, the, the family is organized among pat, around this patrilineal ideal, then we'll begin to see a devaluation in um, uh, the, the lives of uh, women and daughters especially. There'll be underinvestment in the lives of daughters. Uh, and we may even see son preference uh, arise. And from that son preference, we'll begin to see a depressed age of marriage for girls, where if women are gonna be married out, you might as well marry them out when they hit puberty, right? So as you're not bearing the costs of raising those girls. And from all of this comes a very deep inequity in family and personal status law, where women may have very, very, um, um, circumscribed rights, rights to divorce, rights to child custody, rights to travel, rights to take a job, rights to, to own her own wage. Coming up the uh, left side there, we see two variants uh, in societies depending upon whether women's labor is considered to be valuable or not. If women's labor is considered to be valuable, then what you usually see is the, um, the rise of what we call a bride price slash polygyny culture. Bride price is where the groom's family pays the father of the bride for the right to transact the marriage. Because her labor is valuable, he needs to pay. And as a result, rich men can then amass more wives and become wealthier because women's labor is so very valuable. There are other cultures where women's labor is not considered very valuable. And in those cultures, you see what we call a, a, a dowry sex ratio altered society. In a dowry society, that's where the bride's family has to pay the groom for the purposes of taking on the burden of the, uh, of the bride. Uh, and as a result, many families feel that um, their household is actually financially threatened uh, by having daughters. And so you begin to see families cull daughters from their family. And of course, this has been the historic condition of, uh, of India for quite some time. All right, so here's all the magnetic beads. Here's our syndrome that we're looking at that sort of tips us off uh, that we have a, uh, uh, we have uh, the subjugation of women. But what I'm here to tell you is that syndrome of the subjugation of women is actually a monster. A monster that not only harms the lives of women, but harms the children that they produce, and by extension, harms the entire society. All right, and that's what I want to discuss with you today. What does subordinating women have to do with security, you might ask? 
And I think this is a very important question because this goes beyond seeing WPS as some kind of, you know, uh, DEI initiative, right? Yes, we're very interested in diversity, and I can make an extremely strong claim for why it's needed, but there's something more going on here. And what I'm, I'm here to tell you is that you destabilize societies when you subjugate women. Let's see how that's so. This is the, those lenses I want you to have. All right. What we see going back in human history is that virtually every human society uh, faces threats from outgroups. And in historical perspective, most of the time, societies have chosen to face the threat from those outgroups through male bonded extended kin networks. If any of you have worked in Afghanistan, if any of you who have worked in Iraq, if any of you who have worked in Sudan and many, many, many other places, you know that that is still the security provision mechanism for these societies male bonded extended kin networks, okay? So when you decide that that's how you're going to assure security for your society, then the interests of women must be subjugated to the interests of that male bonded extended kin network, right? You're going to privilege their interests above the interests of women in order, you believe, to keep your group safe. Furthermore, um, male coalitions are strengthened by the subordination of women in other ways as well. It means that female labor, including female reproductive labor, is gonna be provided to each male member of that coalition. And females will not be able to divert resources from males. Secondly, even when a male coalition member is low status, he will always have higher status than females in society and can dominate in their households. And then lastly, some of you who are um, actually students of, of clan and tribal networks know that male coalitional bonds can be cemented by marriage to each other's female kin. In fact, a little funny footnote, this is actually how Osama bin Laden quelled uh, rivalries among his lieutenants is he would um, order them to marry each other's uh, daughters or sisters in order to uh, actually uh, prevent and preclude those rivalries. All right, so my argument is this syndrome is actually a trap. Seems like it works really well, right? We need the men to defend us, so the male interests are gonna dominate, and females, well, oh well. That's not actually how it works, all right? What we're gonna argue uh, is, is first of all, you can tell how powerful these kin networks are by how many of those beads in the syndrome they have. But secondarily, and more importantly, this type of security provision, all right? This, this privileging of male interests over female interests in societies because of security threats, uh, is, is going to lead to unfortunate consequences for the society, right? What you're gonna find is instability, violence, terror, corruption, and autocracy. And if you're familiar with some of the societies that I'm talking about, you know they're all rife with those. But what we're arguing and what we contribute to the argument is that this is because this kind of political order is based on the first political order, the sexual political order. And in this case, then, it's based on domestic instability, domestic violence, domestic terror, domestic corruption, and domestic autocracy. So how could it be otherwise, right? If that's what you build on, that's what you get. Furthermore, such societies will also experience the consequences of a devaluing anything that is a female-coded task, okay? So, for example, uh, we know that women are almost always tasked with 
maintaining the health of the family. So if you subjugate women's interests then, you're gonna see a lack of attention to the health of the society, and that's what we find. Where women are subjugated the most, have the lowest life expectancies, the highest morbidity rates, and so forth. So things like poor health, food insecurity, low economic performance when you're taking out the talent of half of your population, rontierism, demographic woes, and lack of attention to environmental security is what we argue will be some of the outcomes that you see of deprioritizing women's uh, concerns. In other words, if you take nothing else from what I've said today, all right, this is the one you can write down in your notes and say you listened. What you do to your women, you do to your nation state. And it means if you afflict your women, all right, you're gonna afflict your nation state. All right. Where do we find more of the syndrome beads? Right? And this is where the Department of Defense was actually critical in helping us in this research. We did receive a Minerva Initiative Research Grant for which we are eternally grateful that allowed us to spend uh, four years and about a million and a half dollars of the Defense Department actually operationalizing these variables, going out and finding those beads, and then uh, being able to produce this map, which I don't think is gonna be a surprise to you, right? I think all of us know where some of the, the, the most difficult areas for women in the world might be. But this is a way that we were able, in a sense, to quantify right, how many of those beads are in place. All right. So you might be saying at this point, all right, Professor Hudson, I get the overall point, but like what? Well, let me give you a couple of examples of these linkages between what's going on with women and what's going on with national security. Sometimes the links are quite immediate and proximate. An example of this is surging bride prices. Remember what bride price is now. Bride price is uh, in countries where women's labor is valuable, the groom must pay the father of the bride uh, money or, or valuables in order to contract the marriage, okay? So uh, except at the very elite level, there's usually kind of a going rate for a bride. And as you can imagine, every father is kind of looking at every other father to see if they're gonna go above the, um, the going rate. And so bride prices uh, are often uh, a, a more sort of flat tax, so no matter where you are in the income spectrum except at the elite level, you're gonna have to pony up um, that bride price. But secondarily, that bride price rate is usually subject to irrational um, uh, rises, often dramatic spikes over time uh, as people sort of one up themselves in the going rate for a bride. So many governments try to force bride price into remaining static, never works. Uh, and bride price tends to inexorably rise, the rise can be dramatic. And searching bride prices also fuel polygyny because rich men can afford brides even when poor men can't afford brides. And this means that you are developing a larger and larger segment of the population of poor young men who will never be able to get married or will find it extremely difficult to get married. And what you uh, get as a result is a very deep sense of grievance among these young men, uh, significantly delaying or even precluding marriage in a society where not getting married is, is the end of the line for a young man in a patrilineal society. So for example, one of the things that I would be paying attention to as a national security specialist is what's the average age of marriage for men right, in, um, in societies that still uh, subjugate women. And as that rises, you're gonna see greater instability. Does it help to know that on the eve of the Arab uprising in Egypt, the average age of marriage for an Egyptian man was 33? It would take him that long to save up enough money to contract a marriage. All right, now, rebel groups offer remedies, right? Join us and you will obtain the resources to be able to marry. Or 
will kidnap a woman to be your bride. And so, interestingly, that is exactly what we see with the saga of Boko Haram, right, during the uh, first decade or so of the century. There was a huge jump in bride prices in northern Nigeria in the early 2000s, and Boko Haram openly used it as a recruiting strategy. Join us and you'll be able to marry. So uh, wives are abducted, uh, or girls are stolen and sold, and the money used right, as, as bride price. What the Western media didn't pick up on is when these girls are kidnapped, there's often token money left on the ground, which legitimizes the marriage of these girls because a bride price was paid. One young lady who was kidnapped explained, in this crisis, these men can take a wife at no extra charge. Usually it is very expensive to take a wife, very hard to get married, but not now, okay? So something that I am sure is not in the curriculum of the Naval War College, bride price trajectory may actually be fueling instability and uh, help in recruitment to rebel and terror groups around the world. All right? And it's not just northern Nigeria. There have been excellent case studies of South Sudan, Pakistan, Timor-Leste, and other nations that can directly trace increased violence and instability and conflict all right, within their society to bride prices rising dramatically. All right? See, that's not part of our situational awareness, is it? That is important that it should be. Let me give you an example. After our book was published, I got an email out of the blue. Now, this is still when the Americans were in Afghanistan uh, from a State Department employee uh, living in, in Kabul, right? And uh, he wrote and he said, I feel like an idiot. And he said, um, not two months ago, we had uh, you know, a group of village elders from the province uh, south of us come to us and uh, they complained about marriage costs. And I said, yeah, it's bad all over. Here in the U.S., they want to release doves and, you know, go on expensive vacation. You know, it's awful. I totally commiserate with you. <laughs> and he said, after I read your piece, I was like, Oh my gosh, they were trying to tell me something. They were trying to tell me that because bride prices had risen dramatically, they knew that their young men would join the Taliban in greater numbers in the coming spring. They were trying to tell me something and I didn't understand because I didn't have the lenses to see that what's going on with the first political order is going to affect the security of the society. All right? Situational awareness. All right, sometimes the links are, are longer term and more structural. And here I would point to uh, alterations in sex ratio. And perhaps that might be part of your curriculum at the Naval War College. All right, in an unaffected population, a natural population, right, the overall male-female ratio is 98 men per 100 women because women tend to live longer than men, all right? However, um, in uh, this 101.8, which is the new global overall sex ratio, is absolutely abnormal. And there was no natural disaster that created this. This is entirely man-made. And it is made by the alteration in the birth sex ratios, where either through sex-selective abortion or female infanticide, girls are being culled from populations in countries where the first political order, the sexual political order, devalues the lives of women. So when I first began studying the question, in 1990, there were five nations that had abnormal birth sex ratios. And abnormal birth sex ratio is, is, is pretty much anything over 107 boy babies being born for 100 girl babies. However, now there are 18, right? This is an ancient evil that did not disappear 
right, that actually grew over time. And you can see that whereas the first five countries were all in Asia, right, um, now we, we would be looking at places like Afghanistan, Albania, Armenia, Azerbaijan. Notice even the religious differences here. China, Georgia, Hong Kong, India, Kosovo, Montenegro, Nepal, North Macedonia, Pakistan, Papua New Guinea, the Philippines, Samoa, Serbia, Taiwan, and Vietnam, right? This alteration in birth sex ratios. In addition to the alteration in birth sex ratios, we also have the issue of migrant flows, okay? You may recall in 2015, that was the great year of migration into uh, Europe. And nations vastly differed in how they responded to it. Hungary, of course, closed all its borders and said, nobody's coming in. Germany said, well, we'll take a million. Sweden, bless their little Swedish hearts, said, we'll take anyone who can get here. And not only that, if you're under 18, we will never, ever deport you for any reason. Well, you can imagine what happened, right, is that a lot of folks went to Sweden. But did you know that 85% of them were male, young males, many of whom were claiming to be under 18, even if they weren't under 18. And so when Sweden counted noses the next year, the next year, 2016, among its 16 and 17 year old population, there were 123 men for every 100 women. Do you know what the corresponding rate in China is? That land where we think of sex ratio alteration? In China, it was only 117 men per 100 women. So Sweden had voluntarily absolutely dislocated its natural sex ratio. Was that a security issue for Sweden? Oh, you bet. You bet. It is a big, big security situation for Sweden. I'm sure you've seen the articles about how murders, bombings have skyrocketed in peaceful Sweden. A lot of it had to do with the fact that they they purposefully, voluntarily altered their sex ratio. Now, Sweden did a complete U-turn on that. And part of the reason was, is they felt it was important for Sweden to have a normal sex ratio. This became a rallying cry, right, for, for feminists in Sweden who said, you don't have the right to alter the sex ratio because there are consequences for women and there are consequences for the security situation in which we live. All right, so when you alter the sex ratio so it becomes highly masculinized, there are many things that happen, right? Uh, the literature on this is, is very big, right? Crime rates and political protest rates go up significantly. Bride prices will surge. Crimes against women, such as trafficking and prostitution, explode, and you get mobility restrictions for women as a result. Uh, HIV and STD spread increases dramatically, and I would argue, especially for this particular audience, that you get an altered calculus of deterrence. China now admits it has 50 million more young adult men than women in its society. 50 million more young adult men than women in its society. All right? One of the great things that nations are afraid of are long drawn out wars of attrition because of how many men you lose. Well, does the calculus of deterrence change right, when you have so many men that are surplus to the number of women in society? Right? Does what deters a normal sex ratio to society not deter a society with a highly masculinized sex ratio? That's a very interesting question. All right, so you knew at some point I was going to present some undecipherable numbers, right? Because I'm an academic. So here go the undecipherable numbers. All right, 
Is there empirical evidence that high syndrome scores are associated with worse outcomes for nation states holding other variables constant? And the answer, you are not surprised to hear, is absolutely yes. <clears throat> with our DOD grant having operationalized the syndrome, we were able to use, uh, since we had to do a cross-sectional analysis, right, we did a multivariate regression, seven control variables. We're looking at nine different dimensions of nation state outcomes, such as stability and governance, security and conflict, economic performance and rontierism, health and well-being, demographic security, education, social progress, and attention to the environment. All right, we chose a very strict standard for significance. Those of you who've been forced to take statistics class, our cutoff for significance was not 0.01, it was 0.001, okay? Uh, secondarily, we looked at 161 outcome variables in all. You know, I have to read all of those, but we were keen not to just use a small little set of outcome variables, but we wanted the widest possible look at nation state outcomes. Um, our statistician who was working with us on the project twisted our arm and they uh, used some factor analysis to get it down to 122. Um, but still, this is probably the most comprehensive look at how the situation of women is linked to a wide variety of national outcome variables. Okay, so what were our findings? All right, we had 24 measures of political stability uh, and instability and freedom and autocracy. And in 100, 100% 100 of those runs, right, the syndrome was significant at the 0.001 level and was either the largest or second largest in terms of effect size in the model, 100%. Conflict and insecurity, 70% of the model runs. Political terror, 100%. Okay, there's some great research that shows the tight connection between political terrorism and the subjugation of women. 24 measures of economic performance, 62.5% of the model runs. Rontierism, 50% of the model runs. Public health and well-being, 70.8% of model runs. Environmental preservation, that kind of blew me away, 85.7% of model runs. So you subjugate women, you're much less likely to be paying attention to the environment. Demographic security, unsurprising here, 85.7%. Educational attainment, 60%. Social progress, 75%. In fact, overall, okay, across all the 122 regression models that we ran, the syndrome, right, our indicator of the first political order was significant at the 0.001 level, 73.8% of the time, okay? That's stunning. So if you're not stunned, at this point you need to go, whoa. All right? That's actually really stunning, all right? If you're into logistics, logistic regression and odds ratios, these odds ratios are amazing. Now an odds ratio measures how much more likely you are to have a worse score on one of the indicators for each step, each additional step that you take towards having that full syndrome model. Fragile state, every step you take, 1.75 times the chance of being a fragile state. 2.3 times the chance of having a government that's autocratic, less effective, more corrupt. I'll let you read the rest there. But these are really stunning logistic regression results as well. If you subjugate women, your nation state is so much worse off. Rose McDermott looked at our findings and she had this to say. She's at Brown University right here in Rhode Island. The findings are clear, consistent, and statistically robust across the board. In fact, the results are the kind of thing most social scientists strive for but never find in the course of their careers. If these findings were about something not related to women, chances are they would be treated as revolutionary in international relations theory. Indeed, the effects are much stronger than those supporting the notion of the democratic peace that has spawned an entire cottage industry of inquiry. 
I leave it to the reader, she said, to ponder my powerful effects concerning the treatment of women on the health and security of states do not receive more extensive attention, right? I think this is right. So if you took an IR theory class here at the Naval War College and they didn't mention this, you should argue for your money back on that class. <laughs> Why do we get these results? Well, I think you can probably already answer them, but let me at least say it out loud, which you already know, right? How does subjugating women contribute to all of this? Well, number one, it's a boot camp. Fascinating findings have shown, all right, that one of the most important predictors of whether a young man is gonna commit political violence is whether he has ever committed it against his girlfriend or his wife or his ex-girlfriend or his ex-wife or his mother or his daughter. Yes, yes, all right? That's one of the most important predictors, for example, in the United States of mass murder. Who's gonna be a mass murderer, right? Because if you cross the line within your own household and use violence there against the other, the woman, then you are far more prepared and willing to use it at a larger scale, all right? There's no better training camp for political violence and instability than lived domestic terror perpetration, lived domestic corruption and exploitation, lived domestic autocracy. It is your boot camp. Secondarily, as we talked about with those two examples, subjugating women is gonna create these chronic structural goads, right? If you have a polygynous society, you're unstable. Sorry. It's like taking a three-legged stool and cutting off one of the legs. You will never be stable. If you highly masculinize your sex ratio so you have 50 million more men than you have women, you have destabilized your society. Sorry. All right, so there's a number of things, right, that can just prima facie destabilize. And lastly, of course, you're disempowering women. All right, the very people who might have a different view of what might be good for the society and profoundly challenge the calculus of political violence. So I'd like to stop right here and ask by a show of hands, how many of you consider yourself a realist? How many of you are a national security realist? Okay, all right, the Naval War College has done its job because most people put their hands up. In light of these empirical findings then, are you a realist if you think that the treatment of women actually does affect national security? Right? Are you a realist if you think that having the lenses that women, peace, and security gives you are important for folks at the Naval War College to learn about? But maybe more importantly, can you call yourself a realist if you don't? Okay. What I'm suggesting here is if you pride yourself on being a realist, it's time for you to look at these linkages and understand them because this is your bailiwick. Women, peace, and security is not some little cherry we put on top of, you know, uh, the Sunday of national security, okay? Women, peace, and security is part and parcel of everything that affects the security of societies. What changes when we become realists, right? At this point, a lot of, of my students will say, okay, I get it. It matters, it really does matter. But nothing would change, would it? Well, yeah, lots of things would change. Let's talk about that. If you're not tracking the situation of women, right, how can you expect to have an effective foreign policy? Right? How will you accurately anticipate uh, instability in other countries if you're unaware of the linkages that we've just been talking about, for example, our uh, bride price, inflationary bride price, or sex ratio alteration, okay? Um, I met a commander who had served in Afghanistan who said, uh, I absolutely track what's going on with bride prices because it tells me how many men I'm gonna be facing the next spring, okay? These things matter. They're part of your situational awareness. All right, 
How will the U.S. decide which subnational actors are more likely to bring stability to a nation, right, when governance is contested, if you don't know how they plan to treat women? If they plan to treat women much worse, and we could make a great case that the Mujahideen uh, in the 70s and 80s was going to treat women worse, is that really the party you should be backing? <clears throat> How are you going to avoid the trap of peace negotiations, which we did not avoid, where the rights of women are bargained away to make peace between warlords if it doesn't understand this linkage? How are you going to track which of your own citizens is the most important domestic threat if domestic violence is not viewed as part of the picture? How are you going to rationally approach immigration policy if you don't understand that uh, it's not what religion you are, what ethnicity you are, what part of the world you come from. It's how you intend to treat women once you get to the United States that may determine how much of a risk you are to the country to which you are immigrating. How would the US know that ending child marriage would do more for world peace than almost any other investment, right? And how do we know that maybe exporting democracy shouldn't be our highest priority in some nations where the sexual political order is so askew. I believe, I'm getting to the end, I believe that one day, one day, the idea that foreign policy or national security policy could ignore the situation of women will be seen as laughably naive. I choose to believe that in a generation or so, when people go back and they read our syllabi and our textbooks that don't even mention women in the context of national security, that those uh, young people will just shake their heads right, at how foolish we were and how ignorant we were. Um, I suppose that I agree with Hillary Clinton, who, when she was Secretary of State, said, the subjugation of women is a threat to the common security of our world and the national security of our country. Remember, what you do to your women, you do to your nation state. If you choose to afflict your women, your nation state will be afflicted, and students of national security need to understand that. All right, thank you very, very, very much. Happy to answer questions. Thank you, Dr. Hudson. I think you've convinced hopefully many in this audience that this is a, these are indeed revolutionary findings in international relations theory. Thank you, Dr. Hudson, for opening up a whole new world of empirically based uh, women, peace, and security for our students and our guests. So please uh, join me in thanking Dr. Hudson. <laughs>